a very good morning the video is on okay <laughs> uh so we have disturbed you early morning on a saturday when otherwise a normal lawyer would like to relax no 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 my morning start very early this is quite late for me it is absolutely fine you can have it earlier still uh so uh, that is a lesson to be learned for all the young young budding lawyers aspiring lawyers and the lawyers like us to learn what is the key for the success so welcome on the board for, on behalf of beyond clc thank you and uh as when we had invited you and requested on behalf of beyond law clc we are organizing different sessions on different uh, topics and that is why so that the young lawyers the students can learn what is all going on mm -hmm. you yourself do not require any further introduction you are a senior advocate additional solicitor general just for the participants who are on the board and i can uh, on my own say that what is amitabh bachan shanshah in the film industry you are what in the uh, this industry <laughs> where people learn about you they learn the style the gait they observe you and i must say that once you visited the, to the high court for the upsc matter people have been charmed they say that if one has to learn to address the issues one has to learn from you so over to you thank you yeah uh, thank you very much uh, vikas very, very generous of you to say all that you did much of it is undeserved but thank you so much nevertheless Uh, it's a very important topic that you have uh, chosen uh, for discussion today, and why I say it's important is because uh, the preeminence of 226 is because of retreat of Article 32. Uh, the Constitution originally conceived had uh, perceived 32 as the linchpin for rule of law. Why? Because it was considered a fundamental right itself. That is the right to move the Supreme Court or the fundamental right itself, and the Supreme Court was then positioned as the protector and guarantor, what is called the sentinel and the quiri. Where law is concerned, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think unfortunately because I think the distortion of the Constitution, the Supreme Court has, as I said, just for... hold on. I, I will just ask because some people are posting in the session that they are not able to hear. Whether everybody is able to hear, just post it on the chat box so that we can see. Because if primarily all people are able to hear, it would be a issue at their end. Because if majority of uh, the people are saying yes, it's fine. Everybody is posted. Thank you. Yeah. Any so any person having a difficulty, they have to check it at their end. Bandwidth, other issues have to be checked at their end. Thank you. So sorry to bother you. No, 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 not not at all, not at all. So as I was saying, was the Supreme Court has retreated from the position of preeminence the Constitution had actually vested in it, and consequently there has been an elevation of status of Article 226. And the elevation of status of Article 226 is because, uh, in so far as the relevance of not just rule of law but constitutionalism, because constitutionalism is a facet of rule of law. and rule of law has to be understood as something distinct from rule of men that is how we began with aristotle and the other thinkers that this talk talked about and it is position to actually contest what is called divine right now divine right of kings as everyone knows has got various manifestations in it and the arbitrary exercise of power is nothing but a manifestation of divine right too so what a judicial review through article 226 does and positions in a constitutional setup is to contest what is essentially an arbitrary exercise of power so what the court says is we will not retreat from the judicial power and not concede to bureaucratic uh, abuse the individual rights and liberties are vested by law in, in people at large and this is here that the relevance of 226 comes in and the relevance becomes more significant because of as i said the diminishing importance of article 32 uh, the fact that the executive uh, which is primarily reined in through the excess judicial review was concerned about 226 as apparent from the 42nd amendment uh, many of the people here would not be aware uh, about the 42nd amendment was but that was in fact part of the emergency wherein the attempt was made by the executive to curtail uh, if not eliminate altogether the powers of the high court so what actually had happened was they amended the existing article 226 altogether they added uh, 226a they added 228a and they also had article 131a in the constitution and the purpose of that exercise was to deny the high courts the power to actually issue writs for any other purpose and i'll come to that in a, in a minute's time what any other purpose is and also restrict the capacity of the high court to deal with ultra virus legislations that which was vested only in the supreme court and even when state law was concerned article 228a had contemplated that only a bench of 5 and 2/3 of that particular bench could decide now why did the supreme why did the executive deal with that the executive dealt with this in this particular manner because in the emergency a case of excess executive excess and complete uh, 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 closure of all avenues of 
democratic expression, uh, the high courts had actually stood up. They had stood up to the executive and used the power of Article 226 to rein in excess. And it is for this reason that 42nd Amendment actually curtailed the power of the High Court, which was corrected by the 44th Amendment. Why am I referring to this is that whenever we deal with the provision, it's very important to know why the provision is there, what's the purpose of the provision, and how that provision has been dealt with, and what are the historically important circumstances which bring to sharper focus the worth of that particular provision. So when we deal with Article 226, you have to keep in mind not only the fact that insofar as the jurisdiction is concerned, which I'll just presently explain is plenary, but there has been attempts to curtail Article 226 and a curtail Article 226 by the very people which Article 226 is used to in some way control. And why is this important is actually the subject matter of what I'll be talking to you today. And as I'm on this particular topic, I'll first deal with certain basic expressions with which, uh, with which we are familiar, but about which you know very little. For example, prerogative writ. Now everyone says the prerogative writ, prerogative writ. Why did the expression prerogative writ come? And is prerogative writ a correct description of Article 226 in the context of what I have said? Now this has got a very interesting history to it. The expression prerogative writ did not come till as late as the 17th century. The writs have got a long history running into about a thousand years. I will not go into that particular uh, uh, exercise because that would that be a subject matter of different uh, discussion altogether. And it was the expression prerogative writ was associated with habeas corpus. And habeas corpus because of a gentleman called Montague. And Montague had replaced Edward Koch. And Edward Koch uh, is credited with Mandamus. When I deal with Mandamus, I'll deal with what Edward Koch did. So what did Montague do? Dealing with habeas corpus, the beneficent jurisdiction, what Montague did was, he said, I will call it prerogative. Because you want to associate the sovereign with a beneficent relief. And therefore, you will elevate the sovereign through the exercise of beneficent jurisdiction through a writ of habeas corpus. Quite obviously different from the present purpose and efficacy of habeas corpus itself. I'm just giving you a history where this is concerned. Now, interestingly, as I pointed out, Montague was replaced by, uh, replaced uh, Coke. And Coke is credited with mandamus which I'll deal with it later specifically in Mandamus. And Pope, when he devised the principle of Mandamus, he devised it when he was punished in, by the sovereign by removing him from the court of common pleas to, uh, to, the, to, to this court, wherein he devised in Bagg's case, the writ of Mandamus, essentially to deal with the question of error and misgovernment altogether because the remedial writ, Mandamus, the remedial writ of extremely extensive nature, which is actually devised by Pope, and devised by Coke at a time when he was actually punished because of standing up to the, to the sovereign, that is the Bonar. But that said, whatever that might be, as far as the writs are concerned, the word writ was basically from the 11th century onwards. It was basically an official communication, which has been issued by the monarch for the purposes of either mandating something to be done, or summoning of particular information, or releasing of particular people, or asking for authority for what, had, what, what, what was claimed. All this were called writs because of official communication sent by the, by, by the uh, sovereign and which subsequently became commanding mandamus, asking for right to hold position quo warranto, requiring a person to be released, that is habeas corpus, accessing the records, that is tertiary. But over a period of uh, about a thousand years, it evolved, it grew, not originally as prerogative writs, it came only in the 17th century, as I explained to you. And later, it evolved, regressed, and moved again where it is today. So the correct way to describe writs today will not be prerogative writ because it's provided for in the Constitution. The correct description of writs today would be not prerogative, but extraordinary writs. So that's called extraordinary. And as everyone knows, where this is concerned, it's, we also write extraordinary original. Why do we call it extraordinary original? It is not prerogative, it is extraordinary. And it's extraordinarily original because this is vested in a constitutional court in the first instance. When I deal with review, primary review and secondary review, the question of originality will become important. So it's called extraordinary original jurisdiction because it's vested in a constitutional court for a primary review of certain actions of the executive and the legislature, where it reigns in arbitrary exercise of the executive and in some way controls through the doctrine of ultra-virus, the powers, powers of the legislature. In devising 226, our constitution favors exhibited extreme prescience. It is, we have to be credited with uh, uh, 
uh, a fair amount of foresight in, in devising something as Article 226. Because as the Supreme Court itself has said, 226 is comprehensively worded. And this everyone must keep in mind. There are no limits on 226 except those which, which can be implied in it for the purposes of decision making in the facts of this particular case. And the other reason for this is, apart from the fact that 226 itself is a comprehensive phraseology, it is rested in what is called a court of record. And a court of record, everyone must know, courts of record are the high courts and the Supreme Court. And the court of record is the court, not only one whose records are kept in for perpetual testimony in, in, in the court itself, but on which there are no restraints on jurisdiction. That is, there is nothing that a court of record can do unless it is shown that it cannot do, which is the exact opposite of what an ordinary court will do. Because the court of limited jurisdiction can't do anything till it is vested with the power to do it. So this is a court of record. This so is the rich iron constitutional courts. These are extraordinary original jurisdiction, an extraordinary original jurisdiction for the purposes of reigning in the executive and for that matter controlling that particular legislature. Now, if this is the purpose of, of a rate petition, then how is 226 worded? That the wording of 226 is very important and it's necessary to keep in mind the difference between 226 and 32. Unlike 32, which is confined only to fundamental rights, as far as 226 is concerned, 226 goes beyond. And 226 goes beyond from fundamental rights to any other purpose. So this, is, this is very important, any other purpose. And it, uh, as I pointed to the beginning, when the 42nd Amendment was brought about, 42nd Amendment had eliminated and excluded altogether from 226 the expression any other purpose. Why? Because it is any other purpose which makes this particular jurisdiction of 226 as potent as it is today. And what is any other purpose? Any other purpose is not just fundamental rights. Because fundamental rights are essentially rights which are guaranteed by Part 3, are available in the state and absolutely basic and integral for any setup, which cannot, in, there cannot be any derogation for fundamental rights. But fundamental rights do not exhaust all kinds of rights. And even if there are certain rights which are not fundamental, those rights can yet be significant and important. That is statutory rights. And statutory rights are public law rights. They do not be elevated to the state of the fundamental right, but rights nevertheless. Now, as far as those rights are concerned, and remedies which arise from those rights are concerned, Article 226 addresses those rights, so Article 32 does not. And that is for this reason, when you deal with any other purpose, and you read any other purpose with the bodies to which 226 will relate, who will, to what will 226 relate? 226 will relate to any person or authority. Now, any person or authority is again important. Any other purpose, any other person or authority. Now, who is this person or authority? Does it mean anything? Yes, it does mean anything. And why do we, why do you say it would mean anything? Here, another principle which you must keep in mind, whenever a constitution does not define anything, or for that matter, any central statute does not define anything, you rely upon what the General Clauses Act. And the General Clauses Act is now constitutionally considered to be an aid to interpretation of the constitution. That's because of Article 367. And when Article 367 says it defines person to me, uh, uh, in, in the constitution to mean any person, a collection of persons, whatsoever, subject, of course, to context to the contrary. So when we deal with to any person, any person will not necessarily mean a statutorily incorporated body. It can mean any person, maybe even a private person. The test is not what the person is or how the person is constituted. The test is what is it that the person does. So the test there would be not just any person, a person who exercises what is called a public duty. So when 226 comes in, and 226 is for any purpose, and any purpose is to any person, any person or authority, the question of that any purpose is, is to some extent even enlarged more to any person or authority to actually vest a responsibility in the High Court to give a remedy and provide a relief which is exhaustive and expansive interfering in every aspect of public law. I'll come to public law later, what public law is, so that this is very important when we deal with 26, that we, we'll deal with that aspect a bit later when I deal with public law. But proceeding on any person authority to the meaning of the expression authority. Now, we, we know any other purpose, we know person, we know General Clause Act, authority. Now, should authority ordinarily, the, um, the, what the meaning of authority, you'll go to part three of the constitution and look at article 12. Article 12 defines authorities, but for Article 226, you will not look at Article 12 at all. 
because 226 is not dealing with fundamental rights alone 226 is dealing with legal rights and fundamental rights any other purpose not just fundamental rights alone so when you deal with authority we will not construe authority restrictively so as to limit it to an article 12 authority you will include in it as the supreme court has also done the context article 12 which i am not going to deal with this for the time being both statutory and non statutory authorities performing a public duty and there have been instances where even private trusts for example those which run a college have been held to be subject to article 226 because the court has found that the what has actually been undertaken by them is not strictly speaking in the realm of private law but it is in the realm of public law so what is the difference between a private law and public law the difference between a private law and public law is basically in so far as the relationships are concerned say of contract or tort and i'll but uh, I will qualify the question of tort where strict liability under Article 226 is concerned, but keeping that aside, personal relationships which arise inter parties between two individuals, so as to in some way in provide an interface between the, uh, the two private individuals without intervention of a third or affection, uh, uh, it's affecting people at large generally or involving any statutory or governmental department or authority. That is actually what is broadly what the difference between a private and a public uh, law, law aspect is concerned. And it is for this reason also, even if a body is a statutory authority, presuming a body is a statutory authority, because the body is a statutory authority, will it lie? No. The answer is no. Because even if it is a statutory authority, then in that event, only that aspect of that authority will be subject to a writ review that which affects public law. That is, it has public law consequences. Why? Because 226 is a public law remedy. So you don't look at the body. You don't see how the body is constituted. You see what the body does. And you see what the body does and you keep it in the context of whether it affects public rights. In that event, the public law remedy. Why? Because as far as the occasion of 226 as a ban, the beginning itself is concerned, it is to deal with the principle of constitutionalism. That is those ideas, attributes, and uh, 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 behaviors which will limit the arbitrary exercise of power. That is, the official action should be defined by and regulated by law. And the purpose of 226 is to enforce that. Now, how does 226 enforce this? Is their method? This comes the difference between a 226 and a suit. How do you, what is the difference between the two? What are the difference between the two? Uh, remedies because even where virus is concerned a virus can be challenged in a suit what is so special about 226 and how is 226 different from a suit proceedings we were already mentioned any purpose we dealt with any authority we've also dealt with public law we dealt with everything how is the difference the difference here is and this is important when your writ court looks into a matter a writ court doesn't look at the matter like an appellate court it doesn't look into the matter by substituting itself for a decision making authority it doesn't examine the matter to see whether the decision which would be rendered could have been rendered differently on facts. It doesn't look into that particular matter to see whether the decision is right or wrong in the understanding of the judge who is considering. What a writ court will do and what a court has to see in a writ proceedings is the method in which the decision is taken. That is, is this method appropriate? Has it been fair? Has the person who has been affected been heard? Is the procedure compliant with natural justice? Has malafide in some way affected it? Is the person acting acting on dictate of, uh, of anyone else? Is there an element of bias uh, in that particular exercise uh, altogether? Is it within jurisdiction? I'll come to the question of jurisdiction because jurisdiction is the key. So all these factors come. You look at a decision and you don't look at the merits of the decision as such as what decision is, but you look at the method in which the decision is taken. And if you find that the method in which the decision is taken, that particular method is in some way infirm, then the question of infirmity which so arises will then render, will then vitiate that decision making process. So the decision making process is then vitiated by that particular method and this is what review. That's the reason why the expression is review. You examine it for the purposes of deciding whether the procedure which has been followed, the procedure which has been followed by the decision making authority that procedure is right or not. Now in dealing with this particular procedure, I mean I'll deal with the question of jurisdiction later, but at first deal with territorial jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction, to what extent will it expand? 
to what extent does it reach? Here it is important to note that 226 was amended prior to 42nd Amendment. Uh, it was amended earlier too. The reason for the amendment of 226 was that as usually enacted, because the writ court's jurisdiction lay only to within the territorial limits of the High Court concerned. There was a view which the Supreme Court endorsed the Constitutional Bench Judgment Election Commission's case that the High Court, only that High Court, within whose jurisdiction the authority was actually situated, would have the right, which gave as to the Punjab Rana High Court, the circuit went Delhi, that gave them the right for the purpose of dealing with these particular issues. Now, there are certain high courts which digress from this, and they looked at 226 to say that no, no, you cannot confine writs only to such courts where the body of the government or department is situated. You have to look at the cause of action. And it is for this reason that the 15th Amendment introduced, introduced Clause 1 8 of Article 226, and which may subsequently became Clause 2 in Article 226. And the expression which was there was that even if the body is not within the jurisdiction of the court concern, that is not situated in the territorial uh, limits of the court concerned if part of the cause of action arises within the jurisdiction. Now, this part of the cause of action which arises in jurisdiction is a beneficent provision, which, because it's remedial, has to be expansively construed, but has led to a fair amount of confusion as to what is the part. Because then, is any insignificant part adequate for the High Court to exercise jurisdiction? Can any circumstance alone rest the High Court to the jurisdiction? How do you say that the satisfied that the test of a part of the cause of action is actually satisfied? Now, the part of cause of action has to be a relevant part of the cause of action. That is something which has a bearing on the controversy. It's not just anything. That is, if the merits of the controversy are in some way in, infringed or impacted by something which is relevant and goes to the meat of the matter, so as to affect the rights of the parties, then any insignificant part too of that particular issue will vest the High Court with jurisdiction. Not that any significant part will vest the High Court with jurisdiction. That is where the key comes in. It is, this is where the key is. The part may be insignificant in the totality of things, but may be relevant for the controversy. And as long as it is relevant for the controversy, the fact that it is only a minuscule part will not in any way deprive the High Court of jurisdiction. That minuscule but relevant part will vest in the High Court of jurisdiction. However, the issue is both insignificant of that, but a communication has taken place, some, some correspondence has taken place itself, but nothing actually turns on the correspondence because the rights are being affected by something else. <coughs> the remedy is in some way impaired by something else. Their correspondence will not in some way, they not necessarily give the cause of action. So it is for the purpose of cause of action, there has to be a real link. And here comes the question of what is called forum convenience. So this is this is important which everyone must know. Because when you deal with cause of action, it also must know certain related terms. Whenever you look at law, whenever you look at things, don't only look at what you're reading. Look at related concepts. Link them. Link them together so that you form in your mind a mental picture about law as a whole. Because law can never be seen in isolated silos. It has necessarily to be seen as a whole. Now, what is called what is called forum convenience, forum non-convenience. Now, forum non-convenience is basically a principle which says that the court which is most suited for a particular controversy should necessarily consider because there may be cases where there can be multiple jurisdictions which may, which may be there in that event. And that event, one of the circumstances will come in, apart from relevance of the cause of action, would also be this particular issue because the question is of discussion itself. So you look at forum non convenience becomes a picture uh, as an issue which becomes important too. And you say, okay, what is the natural jurisdiction? You look at various factors apart from this particular issue. You look at the, the, the convenience of the parties, the relevance of the issues, and all the other aspects which arise that is concerned for the purpose of finding what is known as a natural forum for particular jurisdiction when there is the conflict. So, the question of relevance, the forum of non convenience will then go together for the purpose of the vesting in the court of jurisdiction. And while we are dealing with the question of this particular the, 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 the cause of action, the relevance, the territoriality, the territoriality of it, what must also be kept in mind is that insofar as this question of locus, which I'll just elaborate in a minute's time is different, which becomes related to the question of locus, which is different from the right to cause of action. Now, what is locus? Because we dealt with the ambit, we dealt with the sweep, we dealt with the limits. Now, who is it? Who is it? So, sorry to bother you. A uh, large number of people are sending me WhatsApp and all. They are saying, you, you are too perfect to speak so uh, fast. Uh, they said, kindly be slow, they, uh, uh, since large number of students are there. Very well, I'll speak slow. I, you just give me one hour, so I have to compress it. No, no, uh, we can extend. Uh, we always say it's not a 
20 over match or 50 over match that it has to be over in that particular way very people well. are just joining and joining uh, you right. can't uh, you can't ask rohit sharma to stop hitting sixes no 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 i i i i yeah thank you yeah, no, I'll, I'll be slow whenever you think i'm going fast to stop me uh, you can just, no no uh, just uh, stop yeah, I'll, I'll go I'll, I'll i'll go slowly actually i was compressing it in one hour no, no, uh, you, you you can be just like a gas you can expand the way you want the <laughs> vessel is yours the gas is yours no no very well so what i was what i was talking about is i was i was uh, uh, on this question i had dealt with the question of territoriality i dealt with the question of link i dealt with the question of forum non convenience now i come to the question of locus locus is also dealing with it. now locus is entitlement of a person to come to the court that is a qualification of a person to actually bring a dispute before the court now there is a movement where locus is concerned also but 26 is concerned because originally prior to 1981 the rules of standing were rather restrictive the rules of standing were restrictive because it was felt that only the person who is actually affected whose right has been impaired or whose legal interest has been injured alone can come to court that is the courts looked at it rather narrowly there was a change in the thought process later and the change in the thought process is not only the majority in legal thinking but as also suits the purpose of 226 because as i began in the uh, uh, speaking on this subject i said that 226 is now preeminent it's more significant than 32 and even the terminology of 226 is far more expansive so the reach the sweep the efficacy the significance of 226 is far superior to article 232 today though article 32 has, has been placed on a higher status by the constitution now we have to give suit the requirement of locus to 226 and what did the supreme court say supreme court said it uh, uh, very pithily and uh, very eloquently uh, very uh, very beautifully they said let's see uh, we will discard the anglo indian system we will abandon the restrictive rules we will embrace participative democracy the purpose here is to empower the individual the in need to empower the individual is to rein in the executive not just rein in the executive have some control of the legislature why do you need to control the executive and legislature because they have the authority they have the authority to alter jura relationships they have the authority to make impositions so if we have a restrictive rule of standing and we deny a person who is actually bringing to the attention of the court the fact that there is a wrong then in that event we let the bureaucracy or for that matter the legislature free to abuse and misuse the law now the mis- abuse and misuse the law must be prevented and why will it how will it be prevented by providing a recourse access to justice that's the reason why the supreme court has later said and that's the reason why i keep saying it again and again whenever you read always read a concept in the context of related concepts so access to justice is itself a human right the supreme court has said that now access to justice is a human right if access to justice is a human right locus cannot be strictly construed and when dealing with the question of standing what you will have to necessarily have to see is that the person who is not just a, a wayfarer as the supreme court says but a person having a legitimate interest raising an issue of significance for the purposes of some way controlling exercise of power so the supreme court post 1981 expanded the issue of locus and expanded the issue of locus and that we also had what's called social action of public interest litigation also but even apart from that say for the matter of corporations there is a change in thinking even where corporations can serve i am deliberately referring to corporations because these kind of matters will be coming to court frequently so from chiranjit lal's case downwards there has been a change in also in thinking because first the court distinguished between the company and the shareholder and they said that see the shareholder has distinct rights the company has different rights so where a company is affected a shareholder can't come but where a shareholder is affected a shareholder may come so the supreme court then moved away from that thinking also and said that they may be the cause of action may be composite and because it is composite it will affect it can affect both the company and the shareholder too because just like freedom of expression is concerned or for that matter acquisition of shares is concerned it can affect the rights of the person the shareholder at the same time as far as issues concerned can affect the profitability of the company and because there is a convergence of, uh, of the interests were there the distinction which is there between say a corporation and a shareholder was to some extent removed altogether so there has been a movement there has been a movement in relaxing the question of standing 
But while you say that relaxing the question of standing which has come, and of course the spawning of public interest education elsewhere has also come, this is a related facet of it. What you must keep in mind is that as far as this, this issue of locus is concerned, is different understanding justiciability. And I, I'm deliberately referring to various concepts because these concepts should play in your mind. Locus is different from justiciability. Justiciability is the right which you have, which is infringed. As God, it is different from locus. Locus is a standing which makes the court recognize, recognize you as a person entitled to come to court for the purpose of raising a dispute. Justiciability looks at the dispute which you raise to see that the court will in fact grant you the relief which you are seeking. And while on this particular issue, these two, these two things are often confused. Locus doesn't mean justiciability because not trying locus, it can be shown to be non-justiciable too. In the rich, in any case, where locus is concerned, not all rich are at the same level where locus is concerned. Because in certain rich, implicitly, I just talked here how change took place uh, post-1981. In all rich are not the same where locus is concerned, say for example, habeas corpus, or for that matter, co warranto. The requirements of locus, both in habeas corpus and co warranto, are very different from a rich, say, a mandamus or a certiorari, or for that matter, even a prohibition. They'll be different. Why? Because as far as a habeas corpus is concerned, a habeas corpus or that of co warranto, it's not necessarily the person who is affected. Someone, someone, everyone knows. Any, anyone other than the person who is affected can come. So, he just stops everyone knows. You see it every day happening. Go down and deal with co warranto because co warranto doesn't come that often. Now, what is co warranto? Co warranto is basically sure right. Sure right what? What sure right to what? Sure right to office. Why do you need to sure right to office? Why? You need to sure right to office because public offices should be protected from usurpers. You cannot just go up, go to an office and say, This office is mine. Because the office has got a public position, it's got public consequences. You have a uh, power which uh, entitles you to interfere in personal or private relationship. So usurpers have to be kept away. And it is a facet of what is called good governance. So insofar as co-warranto is concerned, both latches, which I will deal with later because then I, we have to deal with latches if everybody is concerned, and locus are to a large extent diluted. Latches and locus are diluted. Why? Because the court says, no matter who you are, no matter how late you've come, if you bring to the notice of the court the fact that there is a person who's a usurper, or there's a person who's not qualified to hold office, or there's a person who does not possibly have the right to particularly hold that office, we will not say, okay, you came late or we don't know who you are. We are more concerned with the office or the you raise agreements. And we will look into it to see whether that particular person is actually entitled to hold the office. So where these writs are concerned, apart from the general expanding of the question of locus, which comes in 1981, implicit in the writs is the requirement of dilution of this particular locus that is implicit in this particular writ. But while on this particular aspect, I just need to clarify because uh, many times when, when we speak, uh, things get lost. When I say qualifications, qualifications are statutory. That is the rules, the entitlements, the preconditions which have to be there. Not the subjective evaluation of a person's capacity to hold office. That is not what co-warranto is concerned. You may feel that person is not good enough. Your feeling that the person is not good enough will not lead you to file a co-warranto itself. For the purposes of co-warranto, you'll have to basically see are the rules, the constitution, the requirements, have they been violated? Have they been infringed? Have they been affected in any manner whatsoever? So that is, it is in that way that, 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 that uh, it, it proceeds insofar as the question of co-warranto is concerned. Now, moving further, where this is concerned, you dealt with the history, you dealt with the impact, you dealt with the locus, you dealt with the standing. Now, can 226, for this reason, you dealt with it, I'll come to merits later, can 227 be restricted? Now, this is where the important 26 comes in. Can you say, okay, uh, this decision is final? So, there are many statutes which say this decision is final. Because the statute says the decision is final. Or even if the constitution says the decision is final, like for Article 217, or for that part of the six, uh, uh, paragraph 6 of the 10th schedule, or for that part of Article 363 of the constitution, at very different facets, or 323 A and B uh, of the constitution, I'll deal with each separately. Merely because something is called final doesn't necessarily mean that the right to judicial review is affected or is impaired in any manner whatsoever, because this is restricted 
destined the constitutional court by the supreme law and what is it is called part of the basic structure the basic structure is an expression which is bandied about rather rather loosely but it's an issue of extreme importance because why is it basic because it's unalterable and because it is unalterable there cannot be any legislative infringement of it and because there is no legislative infringement of this particular thing notwithstanding the finality clause notwithstanding any restrictions the right of 226 remains that for example the judging the age of a judge 2017 or for that matter the interstate water dispute that is 363 it goes to supreme court or for that matter as uh, uh, 323 uh, a and b when it dealt with the administrative tribunal uh, but the supreme court said that it's not it's not as if the tribunal substitute the high court the high court can be excluded altogether it should come to the high court so why do it come to the high court because 226 is part of the basic structure of the constitution and there can be no statute no law which excludes 226 from it so this is so far as that is the significance of where 226 is concerned the very supreme significance of 226 is concerned apart from this uh, the limitations that uh, 226 is concerned the other thing which you must keep in mind also i'll come to the aspect of this uh, uh, factor of this uh, altogether the interrelationship between 226 and 32 i began by saying that 226 is today of far greater significance than 32 but we have to understand also the difference between 226 and 32 that will help things put in perspective now what, what what you should actually keep in mind is that you said something because no it's so, fine sir did you say something no no nothing to you ah right Where, where now 226, the difference between 226 and 32 uh, is concerned. This is this is uh, this is important. I mean, the basic difference is just the fundamental rights and any other purpose. I already pointed out how any other purposes in some way affected by it, but that's not the uh, uh, that's not the uh, only difference you have to bother, uh, be bothered about. What is relevant here is also what is known as res judicata. Now, uh, res judicata, the knowledge of res judicata, the knowledge of constructive res judicata is very important for it. Now, supposing I have more the the supreme court and I, my matter is dismissed on merits if i move the supreme court my matter is dismissed on merits i cannot come to the uh, high court again under 226 bar it's bar to the judicator now not standing section 141 the cpc despite the fact the cpc does not in fact apply the principle of section 11 will apply because section 11 of the cpc so the judicator is concerned is that statutorily incorporate what is high public policy in the high public policy which is there is essentially that there has to be finality to litigation that is what it is that and no person should be vexed twice the same offense uh, for the same uh, cause of action now it is for this reason that if you move a 32 you cannot come in 26 similarly if you move a 226 you cannot go in 32 again you cannot move multiple 226 like you have moved a 226 petition you cannot thereafter move another 226 petition because if as this issue is concerned it will be barred by by the judicator or what is known as constructive judicator we may say okay some point has struck me i will now challenge it on a different ground altogether because i challenge it on a different ground altogether the ground is different because the ground is different you can't bar in that event the constructive adjudicator comes in and constructive adjudicator in prohibits the filing of a second rate petition also now is are there any exceptions are there any exceptions to this yes there are exceptions to this an exception to this is habeas corpus is an exception to this because as far as this issue is concerned the interplay of 32 and 226 if you look at the two section itself 226 begins the first part is it not withstanding 32 and 226 falls will not be in derogation of 32 2 so not withstanding and not being in derogation puts as far as fundamental rights are concerned the high court the supreme court at par that is you guys that is concerned the the relationship situation is at par with that aspect is concerned so if you have moved the high court you can move uh, the supreme court yet not sunny i know the high court though ideally it should be necessary that you have to do it on ground which be different because question of comity will come in discussion may or may not come in ideally 32 discussion should not come in but the way in which the supreme court many times deal with 32 petition this particular point is lost that that can be subject matter of different discussion altogether they're not concerned with that but when you talk about difference the difference has not only to be in form they can't simply say okay, i add a ground to it the difference has to be in substance that is you look at you look at the petition of the whole to examine it for whatever it is worth and in that event a res judic uh, a, a habeas corpus petition can be filed for the same high court again but provided it is substantively different 
substantively different from the first petition. Not different only in form, but different substantively between the two. There's a difference substantively. So as far as fundamental rights are concerned, notwithstanding uh, a moving of the petition, I can yet move the High Court of 226 even after 32 has, has in some way been affected, uh, uh, has been moved unsuccessfully with this concern. So that is the exception where this aspect is concerned. So this deals with 32, 226 broadly, 226 generally. Now I pointed out in the beginning as to the sweep of 226. And I pointed out that it's not dealing with merits, but it's dealing with the method. Now, how do we deal with the method? How do you decide? How do you decide that this decision is right or wrong? So there are there were originally three, and now there are four ways in which it will be seen. Now the three uh, the four ways uh, in which we'll examine is legality, uh, uh, procedural as far as irrationality, and procedural impropriety. They are basically the, these were the three things uh, which were which were examined. Now illegality is essentially one that you don't understand the law correctly. You misapply the law altogether. You the law says something, you say something else altogether. So that is illegality. As far as irrationality is concerned, that is wetness very unreasonableness. What is wetness very unreasonableness? A 9849 case uh, where the court said that what you have to do should be reasonable in the sense that a person fairly disposed. And worst in all that is relevant should actually conclude that what is actually done is right. It should be reasonable. And procedural impropriety or propriety is you have to follow a method which is compliant with natural justice. Do something which is fair. Uh, uh, give a proper hearing. Provide relevant documentation, etc. To this, a fourth principle has been added. And the fourth principle is very important. And it, it is missed altogether. And that's the principle of proportionality. Now, proportionality is something which is which is missed uh, often uh, where this is concerned, and proportionality is a very significant aspect of uh, a development uh, of uh, judicial review. And what you have to keep in mind when proportionality is concerned, the method of dealing with proportionality is different from, say, unreasonableness or arbitrariness. And why do I say so? Proportionality has been seen in two different contexts, where fundamental rights are affected, or where arbitrary exercise of power takes place. Now, when fundamental rights are affected, then the general principle which is there in a 226 petition that the decision maker, that is the, uh, the decision maker's process of taking a decision alone has to be seen and not the decision itself is varied. And the high court will be the primary uh, decision making authority. That is, the judicial review would be at the le primary level in which you will interfere with the decision altogether, not look at the merits only. But when you're dealing with the question of unreasonableness, is arbitrariness, so fundamental rights directly is not involved. That is, for example, Article 14. Article 14 can have a uh, distinction between equality of treatment and arbitrariness. Royapa expanded Article 14 beyond equality of uh, treatment and classification to uh, arbitrariness. So when we deal with this particular issue, as far as proportionality is concerned, the High Court exercising the test of proportionality would where the allegation is of infringement of fundamental rights, be the primary body examining it, and the High Court, which is dealing with the question of proportionality, where the question of arbitrariness is concerned, will be secondary. It will be a secondary review. Why? In the, in this latter case, the High Court will only look at the decision-making process. In the former case, the High Court will look at the decision itself. So proportionality, in some way, enlarges the issue review further, and it, permits the court to go beyond the traditional confines of, of judicial review. So this is so illegality, irrationality, procedural impropriety, and of course, uh, proportionality are the four grounds on which this, uh, uh, this exercise of judicial review actually, actually takes place. Apart from this, that is so far as these aspects are concerned, there are certain related aspects which must, must always be kept in mind. Another pointed out, jurisdiction. What the court in 226 does is deal with the issues of jurisdiction. And what is jurisdiction? Now, jurisdiction is not normally comes in the verbal court of any color and all that that comes in. But jurisdiction is basically the limits of decision making authority. That is, so far as what you use the word abuse, excess of jurisdiction, etc., the question comes. If there's qualification for uh, acting in a particular way, a precondition for acting in a particular way, a manner in which a tribunal has been constituted, in that event, those conditions have to be satisfied before the decision maker actually exercise that, uh, that uh, decision. So that is the question of jurisdiction alone. 
Now, even where jurisdiction is concerned, there's been a change. But just like proportionality has been added to the three grounds earlier, where jurisdiction is concerned, there's been a change also where this question of issue is concerned. And where jurisdiction, the principle is Anisminic's principle. You must read, everyone must read this law as far as Anisminic is concerned, because Anisminic has in some way affected the law of jurisdiction as such by eliminating the difference between error within jurisdiction and error outside jurisdiction. And any error of law today would therefore involve the uh, point of misuse of jurisdiction uh, of the court to entitle the court to interfere. So you have must look into it where this aspect is concerned, where error of jurisdiction is concerned, because this is important. The next issue is malafide, because we talk a lot about malafides here. And it's very important to know what is malafide, because I pointed out in decision making process concern one of the issues is malafide. Now, what is often missed where malafides is concerned, two things. Malafide can be malafide in law and malafide in fact. And the difference between the two is very important because many times we come to court and we are told that, see, have you made a person a party? Making a person a party in a question of malafide would be relevant only in the issue of malafide in fact. Malafide in law is a colorable exercise of power. Colorable exercise of power means that the power is exercised for a collateral purpose. Because power is exercised for a collateral purpose, it's not necessary. That as to the requirement, your nominee impediment of a person, because that will deal with the organization as such, and because it deals with the organization as such, so malafide in law, it's the requirement of impeding a person as a party need not be there. So if you have faces of objection, see, you've not met the person against whom you made allegation of malafide a party, the answer has to be, I am alleging malafide not in fact, I am alleging malafide in law. Malafide in fact is where a person is ill disposed, has hostility towards, is acting under dictation. Or has got some kind of ill will towards it. When you're dealing in malafide in fact, then you have to be specific in what you say, what you write, what you allege, and you have to be absolutely clear in what you actually uh, 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 impute. Because the presumption of law under Section 114 of the Evidence Act is that public act is properly done. So that is something which you must keep in mind where uh, malafide is also concerned. Now comes the issue of another issue, bias. Because bias also comes in various aspects of concern. Now, when, when you deal with bias, it's also to keep in mind what is the kind of bias that you are actually talking about. And in bias is concerned, there are two issues which always come, which I must, I must tell, uh, tell you because there's a lot of confusion where this is concerned. Bias can be uh, two kinds. The expression can be real likelihood of bias and suspicion of bias. Now, the two are used interchangeably. And what is the difference between real likelihood of bias and suspicion of bias? This is, this is, this is uh, uh, very important. Real likelihood of bias, there are some Supreme Court judgment which says the same. They are not the same. Real likelihood of bias leads it to the court to judge objectively whether the decision which has been taken is correct at all or not. As far as the suspicion of bias is concerned, the suspicion of bias it moves beyond what the perception of the court is concerned. And the general understanding of what a person may feel about uh, another taking a particular decision. So when you are dealing with the question of bias, the law which is prevalent in India, the law which is prevalent in India is not suspicion of bias, but real likelihood of bias. That is, that is actually the test which, is, which must necessarily be considered. And then again, when you come in court, what is the question of latches? Because these are various issues which come. You must know what it is. What is latches? The Limitation Act does not necessarily apply to 226. Limitation Act does not apply to 226. And how do, how do you control litigation? Can you come to court at any point of time? The answer is no. So what the court says is you have to come to court at a reasonable point of time. But what is a reasonable point of time? To get a reasonable point of time, we import what is the equitable doctrine of latches. The equitable doctrine of latches is essentially a doctrine which says that if by reason of delay, you can be shown not to have acquiesced in a wrong act, or you can be shown not to have waived a wrong, or if in that particular point of time, there is nothing which has arisen, which has in some way impacted or created third party interests, in that event, you can still come to the court not sign the delay. The delay. That is, that there is a difference between a delay and latches. Delay is statutorily prescribed. The limitation may be beyond what is statutorily prescribed as long as it does not infringe the principle of latches. And because as long as does not infringe the principle of latches, mere delay at all will not come in. And the Supreme Court, in various cases, has condoned delay even up to 12 years where the circumstances of the case so warrant, particularly where. Fundamental rights concerned, as I pointed out, where co warranto is concerned, over that matter, fundamental rights are concerned, the question of latches is secondary important because the principle of good governance is important. 
because the principle of good governance is important. Therefore, latches will not bar that particular remedy too. So that is something which which must be also kept in mind. Then this question is question of fact. This question is always come that is relevant across across jurisdiction. Many times you say no, 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 no. This is a disputed question of fact. And the court, the writ court, is a court of summary jurisdiction because the writ court, the court of summary jurisdiction, we are not going to go into question of fact. Again, this is wrong because across petitions, where a court is concerned, the court is both the court of law and a court of fact. And because the court is a court of court of law and court of fact, mainly because disputed questions of fact and law, that by itself will not in any way affect the uh, uh, conferral of jurisdiction with is concerned. And the court is competent also to look into the question of fact. The only test is it should not be too complicated. It should not require elaborate evidence. And the right should be established, though the exercise or the merits or infringement of it may be disputed. Because what the test which you must keep in mind is a writ never lies to establish a right. A writ always lies to enforce a right. So if the right is to be established in that event, the writ is not an appropriate remedy because of the disputed question of fact which comes in. So a disputed question of fact also this issue is concerned. Just keep that in mind. Don't give a straight away answer to the disputed question of fact. Therefore, the writ will not in any way lie by. Coming back to 226, the purpose. Coming back to the history of 226, the amendment. Okay, again, again, the request has come slightly slow. But I still okay. realize uh, when Virinda Sehwag is playing, whether it is T20, 5-day or a, uh, this, he will play in his own style. But still, <laughs> let it slow. Very well. Okay, so I was uh, I was on the question of latches, and because I was on the question of latches, I pointed out that you will not statutorily bring in the periods of limitation in the statute that goes to discretion of the court. The basic judgment of Justice Rayatullah in Tita Gad's case, that is the Justice Rayatullah judgment, which actually mentions this particular thing on a case-to-case -case basis, looking at what, how, how the matter, how the matter proceeds for the purposes of deciding whether there is a cause for interference. As long as what are the three tests? No acquiescence or waiver. That is, I am not acquiesced in that particular thing, not waive that particular right. Two, no creation of a third party uh, interest. And so far as the controversy is concerned. And three, the cause, the relevance, or justification for interference. So latches will not bar. Question of fact will not oust. Bias, in fact, is different from bias. In law, in jurisdiction, the difference between error in and error outside jurisdiction is now eliminated. As far as locus is concerned, locus is enlarged. As far as proportionality is concerned, the question of proportionality becomes the test becomes different. Judicial review is now, insofar as extending even beyond the traditional realms of it, to deal with the question of proportionality where fundamental rights is involved. So, 226 is metamorphosizing into something. Which is which was originally comprehensive, but has become more so because of the way in which it's been interpreted. And the reason, and the reason for that, as I keep saying, is the purpose of 226, which is what you had pointed out. Why do it? Why do we need to traverse 226? Because if rule of law has to have a play, if law has to be supreme, if misgovernance has to be avoided, if arbitrary power has to be kept under check. If bureaucracy has to be in some way confined, if the legislature has in some way to be limited, if the constitution is to be supreme, judicial review has to reign. And it is judicial review which for this reason becomes part of the basic structure because implicit in judicial review is the supremacy of law. And the supremacy of law is declared by the court. And it's declared by the court when vigilant and intelligent individuals bring efficacious issues which raise pointed queries on matters of public significance for adjudication for the court that then exercises its constitutional power to rule on what is right and what the court rules on what is right prevails because law is what the court says but the court will not say anything which is right unless you are rightly disposed towards law and you know law yourself. And that is the reason why you need to traverse 226 intelligently and understand it holistically so that when you go to the court invoking this particular provision, the responsibility which you shoulder, considering the hoary history of 226, is duly vindicated by your understanding the concepts that underpin it and the machinery which activates. 
uh, as far as this is concerned, we dealt with this talk. One very important aspect is alternative remedy. Alternative remedy, every time you say this is the alternative remedy. Why is the question of alternative remedy important? I'll, because everyone knows an alternative remedy is a bar. But alternative remedy is not always a bar. And this is a, you must keep in mind. The test which you must keep in mind is an alternative remedy is concerned. Alternative remedy is a question which, which arises. It's a question of discussion and uh, 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 of the court, not an issue of jurisdiction. That is, it's a policy and convenience which the court uh, in some way uh, uh, evolves for the purpose of deciding whether it's to entertain it or not. There is no bar on the court to entertain a writ petition under 226, even if an alternative remedy exists. This is this must keep in mind because of the purpose of 226 itself. And the exceptions in any case, the known exception the alternative remedy is concerned, are a when you challenge the virus. When it is something because why why is it that when you challenge the virus, alternative remedy is not a bar? Because in that event, the alternative mechanism itself has got no efficacy, it's got no play because it is ultra virus, because the procedure is ultra virus, so don't in any way act on it. Two, where fundamental rights are affected. If fundamental rights are affected, the right, the constitution recognizes that right. And you cannot possibly say it because fundamental rights can be waived or abandoned because the constitution that guarantees them where fundamental rights are concerned, they also are in some way or existing alternative remedy will not in any way avail. And third, where there is procedural impropriety by natural justice, so the person is condemned unheard. Or a, uh, uh, the way in which the decision making is actually rendered is completely unfair, disposed with some kind of hostile intent towards objective decision making. If that is shown in that event, the existence of alternative remedy alone will not in any way bar the, 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 the writ. Which brings me finally to writs. Now, this is, these, are, these are essentially principles across writs. So, what are the writs? The writs are basically, as everyone knows, habeas corpus, mandamus, certiorari, uh, prohibition, co warranto. I talk about habeas corpus and co warranto. Habeas corpus produced the person. But where habeas corpus is concerned, we have to keep in mind so people haven't addressed it uh, appropriately yet. The question is what is the date of return? A habeas corpus is judged at the date of return. Now, there can be different dates of return depending on the circumstances. There's a view which says then it is filed, there's a view which says then the return is filed, that's when the counter affidavit is filed. So the test is, if from the date of where the, the writ petition is filed, till the date the counter is filed, there is no change, then the test would be on the date the petition is filed. But if from the date the petition is filed to the date that the reply is filed is a change, it will be on the date of the return. So the date of the return will vary depending on the circumstances of the case. As far as mandamus is concerned, mandamus, as I pointed out beginning, Edward Pork, Remedial jurisdiction of the most extensive nature to correct error and misgovernment. So it is wide in its sweep. It is supposed to actually address every form of misgovernment. It's a remedial writ of the most extensive nature, very, very wholesome writ. As Sosharari is concerned, Sosharari is error of jurisdiction. I talked about jurisdiction, what jurisdiction is, and as the jurisdiction is concerned, must keep in mind Adam Swinnick and the law which follows, as far as this particular issue is concerned. So as to keep in mind the error within and error outside jurisdiction, it's rather complicated. I don't want to take time with Anis Minik. It'll, it'll do you uh, uh, good if you read Anis Minik and a judgment of the Supreme Court in 2019 or 20 in Embassy's case that examined Anis Minik. That is the search is concerned. co warrant I also pointed out, but what co warrant is, that is right, right to hold for the purpose of this government. And prohibition, where that's concerned, prohibition is to bar something that is the state becomes different. Prohibition, unlike certiorari, is exposed. Uh, so far as the issue is concerned, certiorari is to quash the decision, prohibition is to restrain a person from assuming jurisdiction. But while these writs are there, 226 talks about in the nature of. So it's not that these writs should be in the sense they are understood in English law, they are in the nature of those writs and they have to be in some way be rid of the technicalities it's affected. So this is one. And you do not issue writs only, you issue directions, declarations, and orders too. And that's what 226 is dealing with. It's not just writs in the nature of what I pointed out, but declaration, direction, and orders too. And declaration, direction, orders may not be writs. Like you can order, say, uh, uh, refund of money if it is consequential upon something. Or you can declare an act ultraviolet, uh, 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 an act ultraviolet. So that's declaratory relief. Order is refund, but is concerned. So the, the remedy is far greater than just issuing writs, which will be 226 is concerned with. And finally, most importantly, as far as 226 is concerned, the biggest and single biggest uh, Indian jurisprudence is concerned is the right to give compensation. 
compensation has come in not only because compensation can be granted in 226 for violation of fundamental rights and violation of fundamental rights on the ground that it is infringement of what is known as the principle of strict liability and it's an infringement of the principle of strict liability which entitles you on established violation of right to petition the court in summary jurisdiction and to hold the person who has infringed your rights liable and the court will in excess of its right grant you compensation and the compensation which will be granted is different from compensation you get in civil law it will not be compensation just punitive in nature for the purposes of misdemeanors and maladministration for violating fundamental rights for which law does not have any tolerance whatsoever so in 226 also that is where we talked about the different suits and rigs you will incorporate into it procedure where that is concerned also to grant compensation so from the way in which it develops from the way in which it began initially to what it has evolved the concept which in, in some way inhabited 226 today is a remedy which is comprehensive in nature to deal with every aspect of misgovernance or abuse and empower those who actually invoke it for uh, invoking the jurisdiction of the court to get either a wrong remedy or a right vindicated. Let's let's start. Sir, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, one of the we have been doing these sessions for a long time. Probably you have just weaved all the threads together and just carpeted a wonderful piece of uh, carpet. And surprisingly, you have weaved up everybody in such a way that the only one question has been posed so far. Everybody was trying to listen to you rather than posing the questions. One question meanwhile has come. How does the doctrine of manifest arbitration expounded in Shara Bamu case expand the scope of judicial review under Article 226? It's a very, very, it's a very, very interesting question. And whoever has started, very intelligent question. I must compliment the person who has ever asked the question. Yes, you see, manifest arbitrariness uh, at, at, in, in, at first glance may be seen to expand. But actually, it restricts in some way. This is it. Uh, and why I say so? Because manifest arbitra arbitration is something which has got, uh, which cannot be legally sustained. That is, no principle or doctrine can actually justify a particular finding. So what the what the what the declaration law does is rather than permit the court to interfere in any case of abuse or misuse, it restricts it only in two cases of manifest arbitrariness, where it is self-evident that there is a wrong. Because it is self-evident that there is a wrong, in that event, that is manifest, that is the expression of the word manifest, that the court interferes where this is concerned. Now, uh, with all due respect to uh, this particular doctrine, uh, this particular doctrine is also used. That's why I say when I, when I talk in the beginning, I say when you deal with concepts, you have to deal with concepts in a very interrelated way. When you're dealing with arbitrariness in any case, you have to also deal with what are you dealing with the arbitrariness about. As I pointed out, the proportionality is concerned. That is, to choose the least restrictive way in which an action is to be taken is proportionality. Because if, you, if I take something which is more than what is required, that is arbitrary. Now, manifest arbitrariness will be a roadblock over here in where question of proportionality is concerned. Because how do you say that as far as the restriction is concerned, it's not restrictive or not? Because you leave it to the subjective opinion of the judge for the purposes of concluding whether it is manifest at all or not. So what is the legal structure, the criteria on which you in some way cabin this particular uh, judgment for the purposes of concluding that it is manifestly so? Because the way in which it is expounded it leads it to the whim of the judge concerned and his ideology and thinking and his assessment of the facts without there being any settled norm for the purposes of application of the principle. So broadly said, as far as this is concerned, this is bound to create some kind of confusion because arbitrariness was there. The question of interference was well settled. The principles are well laid. Manifest arbitrariness, if at all can be said, that see, you cannot possibly interfere merely because you feel that your opinion is different. You will interfere only when you are satisfied that there is no doctrinal basis for that particular decision. But then whether there is a doctrinal basis that decision will in some way be affected by the opinion of that uh, concern also. However, the only way to reconcile this is that you will not, for the purpose of simple disagreement, interfere with the decision unless you are satisfied that there is no warrant for that particular decision or, or that particular enactment. So it's some way restrictive of the way, the extent to which you can go and vindicative of the original intent of 226, it deals not with the merits of the decision, but the method of decision-making process. Uh, 
Amar Vivek, he is a practicing advocate out here. He uh, poses the question, despite uh, checking the ex executive's manifest arbitration, there is need to evolve a better mechanism where judiciary itself exercise executive powers. Where it is commonly observed that judiciary on the executive side is sometimes acting at most arbitrary. I suppose it is a situation. <laughs> Ashok Makkad asks, as per UGC norms, the eligibility of a vice chancellor is 10 years experience as a professor. In two CWPs, Honorable has, has given direction to the follow-up. But state is following the direction. What is the next remedy? No, no. It's, it depends upon, the see, question is, if it is, any action which is being taken is something which is not warranted, in that event, or just contrary to the rules, in that event, uh, the entitlement to interfere exists. So that's, that's not an issue at all. As far as the dues of uh, abuse by the judiciary is concerned, yes, uh, there may be instances that is done. But I personally think as an institution where functionality is concerned of all the organs of the government actually uh, presently functioning, uh, the way in which it is discharging what is actually destined under the constitution uh, is laudable. So yes, there can be excess in every way. We are not in a perfect system. We are not in a utopian environment in any case. There will be excess and some abuse. But on the whole, the system is working fine. Only one aspect I will be clarifying. Some people are posting on the group chat the uh, your views, etc. That we will not take because we are just asking a Q&A, certain doubts which can be creeped in. That will be on some other day when we can ask your thoughts on a different process. What is their take? What is the distinction between, subtle difference between Article 226 and 227? When it has to be invoked and on which platform? No, 226 and 227 are materially different. Because 227, you see, as far as, as we, have, we have the Supreme Court at, at, at the top. Law is is binding uh, uh, on all courts and tribunals everywhere. Now, 227, in some way, gives supervisory jurisdiction of the High Court over all bodies and tribunals subordinate to it. So, the, the jurisdiction of 227 is over the tribunal authorities under the High Court jurisdiction, which in many ways say that the law declared by the High Court and as affirmed by the uh, High Court will be binding on the tribunals. So, that is judicial and actually supervision, more or less akin to 115 uh, of the uh, CPC. But nevertheless, because this is under 227, not limited by 15. So you deal with the question of uh, errors of jurisdiction, which are manifest in 227, to keep tribunals in the bounds of jurisdiction. Now, as far as that issue is concerned, there may be some element of overlap in, say, with certiorari. But in certiorari, it is concerned, it is the person, which, uh, the, the rights are of the individual affected by, uh, by a decision, which can be in some way corrected by certiorari or uh, certiorari verified mandamus or certiorari simpliciter or by prohibition. 227 goes before goes directly the role between the between the high court and the subordinate tribunals in it to keep the subordinate tribunals within its jurisdiction only. So that supervised jurisdiction, which originally was administrative, is now also judicial superintendence of the of, of, of those tribunals. Uh, these uh, this question is often and often being asked in various sessions that when can we use 226 and 482 vis a vis in a uh, case where we want to invoke something for a, in a criminal proceedings. You see, uh, uh, 226 is a practice to invoke 226 and 482. Now, the purpose of 482 is basically to describe, describe it as a criminal writ. Uh, the existence of 482 by itself will not make it a criminal writ. And that becomes relevant because in various jurisdictions, an LPA will not lie. Supposing for 226 for a single judge for 226 482, an LPA will not lie. That is concerned. 482 is a statutory remedy. And so a statutory remedy is concerned, statutory remedy which says not signing anything in this in the code of procedure, the high court will have the power to do whatever 482 says. Now what 482 says is basically a statutory incorporation of what the high court is as the court of record and article 2 and 15. 2 and 15 means the high court a plenary power. And that's what I pointed at the beginning, is a plenary power of a court of record. Exercising power under 482, the High Court being a statutory authority in the CRPC will have limits to its power to the extent 482 says. So, of course, 482 can be interpreted to, in fact, expand the ambit uh, altogether. So, 226, technically speaking, from a conceptual point of view, because it is vested by the Constitution and is in the court as a High Court as a court of record, will be plenary, particularly when I deal with the question of contempt or deal with other issues over there. Molding of the relief, etc., is concerned for that matter, uh, reaching injustice wherever it is found. 482 may be coextensive because it is listed in the High Court itself, it's the Court of Record, but by its nature, being statutory, will to some extent be restrictive because the ambit of the jurisdiction cannot possibly be coextensive 
or uh, overlap with the 226 jurisdiction. The purpose of 482 is basically to describe the rate as a criminal rate and essentially to reinforce the fact that the remedy which is being sought in so far as the High Court is, uh, from the High Court is concerned, that it will not be restricted or restrained in any manner whatsoever so that matter to fault on that term. Next question is, uh, what is the subtle difference between Article 32 and 226? When can one approach 32 and when can one approach under 226? So 32 you can approach where fundamental rights are concerned, it's concurrent. You can move the High Court or you can move the Supreme Court. Uh, you have a right to move the Supreme Court where uh, 32 is fundamental right itself. The Supreme Court is duty bound to hear it. But the Supreme Court today as I pointed out at the beginning has a treated that particular position. It doesn't uh, treat it as a right as such and delegates the parties to the High Court first. Uh, the way in which the Supreme Court does it, there is no pattern, uh, there is no pattern, discernible pattern to it. Uh, it is a subject matter of criticism in any case. But if you have if you have a fundamental right to infringe, the option is with you whether you move the uh, Supreme Court or you move the High Court. Uh, where fundamental rights is concerned, as the, the two provisions themselves say, the rights are the right is coterminous and you can move either court uh, for that particular purpose. So in all probability, if you move the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will first tell you to move the High Court. Uh, for that particular writ, uh, but 226 is not a writ of, uh, there is no right, as unlike 32, which is a right which you have, and it is part of part 3. 226 is outside part 3 and not a right, and therefore gives an element of discretion to the court to deal with it. So, as the qualitatively, it is different between 226 and 32. A friend of ours has asked, can AFT judgment be challenged under 226? Or we need to go SLP. No, no. So as that issue is already before the Supreme Court. In any case, decided in, in by, by an aspect in Deepak Gupta judgment uh, mm -hmm. also. An issue will depend upon essentially because this is a this is a very involved issue. Uh, I cannot uh, have so any. That's sensitive. We'll have nuances to it. Uh, you can have a separate session. In fact, this will this will be because I'll have to examine. I'll have to tell you the AFT Act after 13 and 14. The AFT Act is concerned and 226 is concerned. And of course, correlated with 323 and other provisions also, that will require a separate, uh, a separate uh, webinar altogether. You can have one on that later. Uh, uh, thank you, Amanji. We couldn't. I was just thinking loud within my mind, and WhatsApp messages are just flowing that asked Mr. Aman to come for another session. You thank have you. taken the words from our mouth. We are so happy that you have already acceded to our request. Thank, but, uh, you. thank you in advance. Thank you. Can a legislation be struck down to the extent as it admits ambiguity qua language or intention of the legislation? No, ambiguity, yes, if it is legislation is supposed to precisely the question of rule of law should be known. It should be predictable, it should be identifiable. So if it's ambiguous, it is a clearly ultra virus. There's no question of that. If it's ambiguous, it will be so. But the point is, what is ambiguous? Uh, uh, that would be an issue. If when you when you, when you have a provision, the purpose is you can make sense of that particular provision. And to make sense of that particular provision, you have to look not only at the provision, you have to look at the preamble, you have to look at what seeds it, what follows it. And you look at the mischief it's meant to actually deal with it. In that event, if seeing in totality, you can actually conclude that it has got some meaning or efficacy. In that event, uh, uh, the legislation will be will be saved because there's a presumption. Because what you have to keep in mind is there's a presumption in favor of constitutionality, and the onus is on the person who is alleging that it is unconstitutional to show it to to, uh, to demonstrate it is so, and the court will sustain it to the extent it is possible so to do until it concludes that it is bereft of sense altogether. Uh, the distinction between Article 136 and Article 32? No, they're completely different. Article 136 is an appellate jurisdiction. 32 is an original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to enforce the fundamental right. 136 is not only fundamental rights, all rights in any case which are affected by a person decision making in any body or tribunal. That will be there, There's no similarity between 32 and 136. And what is your take, which is the better recourse to approach High Court or Supreme Court for the infringement of the fundamental rights and why? Uh, ideally, the Supreme Court should, uh, should, should uh, if 32 has been interpreted the constitution uh, as it was then we say it is 32 ideally. But the way in which it is practiced because we see it every day, the, uh, the delegation of a person claiming fundamental right to the High Court is concerned. Uh, the appropriate remedy would be rather to avoid multiplicity is to go to the High Court. And uh, the only downside to that is that while uh, under 32, the right uh, to move is vested. There is no such right in 226. It goes to discretion. So my only problem with this is concerned is 226 does not provide as efficacious a remedy to, for breach fundamental rights as 32. But 32, the way it is interpreted, virtually makes 32 redundant, as I said in the beginning itself. 
and it's not 226 which is now replacing 32 itself as the only efficacious remedy fundamental right subject of course to the discretion of the supreme court which it shows at random to actually entertain petitions under fundamental right when it's so disposed to but then we are basically uh, uh, in the court's hand and leaving it to the court to decide which of the matters it will entertain in excel original decision 32 and when is the criminal writ under Article 226 maintainable uh, as to whether there is a treatment of rights or For violation of criminal, you see, law doesn't make a distinction. These are distinctions which we have made within it. 226 can be both criminal and civil. Depends upon the right infringed, which will actually decide. So if the right is infringed the realm of criminal law, the criminal writ will be maintainable. Criminal writ, you see, this is a very interesting question again, which can uh, always be what is, which one of the, your uh, participant asked, which between 226 and 482, which is there. Uh, in 226, because of the way in which 226 is phrased, the number of reliefs that you can get in 226, that is declaratory relief, directions, orders, uh, will be far more than what you get in 482. Uh, and uh, uh, as, as I pointed out, 226 is definitely plenary. And whether it is a criminal rate is concerned, a criminal rate will always lie where, say, uh, you, you want certain guidelines declared, uh, you want uh, some... Uh, damages against uh, an official or you want uh, a declaration as to how how uh, uh, law has to be administered the better remedy in that case would be 226 if you are primarily against the decision of a of a magistrate or you're concerned against a, a decision of a session judge something which is exclusively in the domain of the crpc alone uh, you don't want to traverse behind beyond the con uh, constraining limits of the crpc then of course uh, 482 so it all depends upon what relief you are seeking so, uh, though the questions are pouring, I will just take the last question. Then, because we have a, as we had requested you, that we will ask you how you have to make a mark as a professional, how you can speak like you without uh, looking at the page, how we can just sum up all the issues in this thing. We will just take a call on that. But, last question of the uh, session Why do you think that we do not invoke Article 227 to challenge the arbitration, uh, arbitral tribunal award? No, because the tribunal, see how a tribunal is constituted. Uh, this is the tribunal constituted by agreement. There's a private agreement over there. So it's not a, it's still not a body in the sense constituted. It's basically an arrangement for the purposes of settlement of private disputes. It'll be outside both, it'll be outside 226 and 136. So uh, because you'll have to look at the nature of the tribunal, it's not every tribunal which will come. Tribunal which is empowered to perform certain kind of public function and vested certain authorities different and apart from one it is constituted by simple agreement between the parties. Uh, now, we are sorry that we will not be taking any other questions. Mr. Aman, I would just ask a short tip because majority of us, uh, I could say also about me itself, as a young lawyer would like to know what a person should do to become a good lawyer, good human being and a good uh, professional to make a mark. What are your take on that? Well, you have to be severe on yourself. Uh, extremely severe on yourself. Uh, one. Uh, very confident in your ability, but that confidence has to be grounded in reality. It can't be just wishful imagination. A lot of respect for the system, which is it's a very solemn occasion. Courts uh, deserve respect. The process deserves respect. Uh, because unless you have respect for what we do, we can't really do it with any amount of solemnity or seriousness which is mandated. And because you have to approach it with seriousness and solemnity, we have to really give it some kind of uh, dignity by the effort we put in. And when you put in effort, it can't be just effort which is mindless. It has to be intelligent effort in which we know what we are doing and have a clear idea about how we how we do it so that we don't either waste our time or anyone else's time uh, on things which are irrelevant and significant. And most importantly, have faith. Faith in yourself, faith in your capacity and be willing actually to have a grueling life in which uh, uh, you will subject yourself to rather meticulous working and uh, not be distracted uh, by things which can make you digress from the course which you've chosen to focus completely on what you want. It's all a question of focus, it's a question of attention, it's a question of energy, and it's a question of character. You need to have character, you need to have energy, you have to have focus and attention, and only then you'll be both a good lawyer and a good human being. Uh, before I propose a vote of thanks, uh, then we have uh, Mr. Amar a good friend of ours, who will also propose a vote of thanks in his own way. We have a different style of a platform. We haven't heard Tansen playing music, but at least after you uh, speaking all, I felt as if I was listening to Tansen. We were just mesmerized the way you uh, took it. 
Uh, Mr. Amavek, just propose a vote of thanks on behalf of Beyond Law CLC. And I would say we have, uh, we have a group known as Beyond Law on WhatsApp, as well as a page on the Facebook and Instagram. Follow us to know the latest updates. Amar, over to you. Good morning, sir. Hi. Hi, how are you? For your very, very lively and uh, uh, encouraging session. In fact, it was like we were running marathon at sprint speed. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I have been personally benefited by you in that uh, competition matter also. We yeah. have seen uh, your guidance. It is immense. Incidentally, in my chamber, my 86 years old father, Mr. Santosh Kumar Agarwal, who has been practicing for 45 years, is also with me. And uh, he was also paying uh, rapt attention to a very, very encouraging session for young lawyers. It was an eye opener. And uh, we are so thankful in Hindi, we say it was Gagar Me Sagar. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> so, thank you thank very you. much, sir. We look forward for more sessions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.